I think that uh, we talk a lot about and we've written a lot in, I don't know how many, UN resolutions and ECOSOC resolutions and resolutions within our own bodies about policy coherence. But the fact is that we're still underperforming, both at the national level and at the multilateral level. That what is the way trade and finance and labor and investment issues and environment and development questions interact? We know that there are not separate compartments and cannot be treated as separate compartments. But we still have a way to go to be able to develop the manners in which we know that they intersect, we know that they synergize, we know that they interact, uh, and we know that according to the priorities you give to certain issues as to against others, you may have policy predominance of some as against others. For example, we have now, I think, closing a circle of about 30 years in which the policy drivers were finance and trade uh, as against other issues in the development in the development agenda. So second point that I want to make, I think that this report helps us understand that moving towards policy coherence and that the effort at saying no, this is just on this issue, this is the fund is just on finance, WTO is just on trade, it's all right in terms of the decision making of those particular institutions and we all have our mandates. But at the same time we have to understand the interactions. And we have to do an enormous amount of work to understand those interactions. Many factors determine uh, the degree and the persistence of informality. Uh, the trade story, uh, however, uh, seems to be that more trade openness tends to be associated with smaller informal economies. And this uh, conforms uh, with much uh, accumulated evidence of the positive association between trade, uh, development, and growth. But, but there are transition costs, and uh, not all segments of society necessarily reap the benefit of trade openness. We've known for a long time that uh, opening trade uh, throws up uh, winners and losers. Jobs are created, but some are also lost, even if not permanently. Time is needed for adjustment. The extent of the benefits from trade depends in part of how this adjustment occurs. And this is why uh, governments uh, should pursue policies that support shorter rather than longer adjustment periods and ensure the transition is facilitated by other uh, supportive policies. Using the panel of data that I mentioned earlier and that we collected for this study, we assessed the effect of a number of trade and other variables on the share of informal employment. We found that while trade openness measured as the share of trade in GDP was negatively correlated with the share of informality, a measure of trade reform, such as cuts in tariff rates, was associated with higher, inf higher informal employment. These results could be interpreted as suggesting that even if trade opening holds the promise of more and better jobs in the long longer run, such reforms tend to be associated with negative labor market developments in the short run. More generally, however, they suggest that we still have a lot to learn about the adjustment process following trade reforms in developing countries. We need to support social protection uh, and creating a kind of a basic social floor because this will help workers in the informal economy uh, to, um, to basically increase their livings and uh, eventually help them to um, uh, to move to the formal sector. Interestingly enough, some of the results that we have in the report actually shows that the, uh, despite um, some uh, arguments against social, social protection or social flaws, in introducing certain elements in a well-designed way is, is clearly helping these workers and is reducing the, informal, uh, the size of the informal economy. Uh, a second element to this is, uh, and this was uh, or again already mentioned, is enforced core labor standards. Again, the crisis should not, certainly not be used as, uh, as an excuse to, uh, to erode it, especially not if we see their positive impact on, um, on economic productivity and on uh, lowering the um, size of the informal economy. 
A second uh, main area of our policy conclusions relates to uh, that, that uh, countries need to facilitate the adjustment to uh, and transition to formal jobs. A uh, very big agenda item on this is, is the development of active labor market policies. Uh, here, extending the public employment service also to the informal economy and helping job searchers in the informal economy to actually uh, be able to uh, access jobs in the formal economy is a very important element to this. And the pilot projects that have been done in certain countries that we have been reviewing show that how, how, how useful these, uh, these policies can be in helping uh, workers to move and find jobs in the formal economy. A key element, and uh, this relates back to the earlier graph that was showing, is, is clearly a focus on education, also in the informal economy. Now, this will be difficult. Some countries do not have uh, education policies that reach out to the informal economy. Uh, it will require some additional resources. But as we show in the report and we discuss, uh, there are elements even in the informal economy where, where countries can build upon. They can build upon existing vocational training systems in order to enhance skilled portfolio also for informal workers and actually eventually help them to move to the formal economy.